allowing this panel to be here today. Thank you. Uh, our topic is innovation and the partnerships that are needed to create real innovation. The format for our panel might be a little bit different from the previous ones. I will start by giving a general problem description of the issue. After that, each panelist will do a short introductory answer question setup, and we will then have a panel discussion after which we will open up for questions on the floor. Uh, so let's get started. To reach the SDGs and to solve the challenges that we are facing today, we need to innovate. Uh, we are continuously underfunded to do that, so we need to find new ways, we need to find new te technologies, and that takes innovation. However, like last year at the European Central Bank Conference on Innovation, the EU Commission has said there is no innovation in Europe. And that is accurate. However, this is a system that is created by the ecosystem itself. And it's not only in Europe, it's actually symptomatic throughout the world. Only 2% of the developed world's population are entrepreneurs. And less than 10% of those companies started are started by women. Those numbers are really not good. If we go to the developing countries, there is a lot more people starting companies and becoming entrepreneurs in most cases out of necessity, but still. However, entrepreneurship and innovation is not the same thing, something that we tend to mistakenly think. It is clearly so that most of the money spent, and when I talk about money spent, I will only be talking about tax dollars. And it's quite substantial. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars a year, tax funding that goes towards innovation. And at the same time, we see no outcomes. Only one country has had the courage to look at this, and that's Norway. But it's not only in Norway there is no outcomes, it's the same everywhere. And the reason behind it is many-folded in the sense that we can't really just pick one reason behind it. So we need new collaborations, new partnerships, new ways to move forward to create innovation. We as the UN, I am at, with the UNOPS, we are not the world's best innovators. Nor are the politicians, nor are the regulators, and nor are the policy makers. So what is our role, and w or what should our role be? Facilitator? Probably. So in an effort to create innovation, you need to have several factors that correlates. You need to have educational systems in place, and so on and so forth. You need to have clear ways to identify what is innovation. And innovation is not watching other people ride a bike and then learning how to ride. It doesn't make you an innovator. The first guy who rode the bike, that was the innovator. Uh, so that is the problem. And I throw over the word to Elaine. Thank you, Jonas. So it's very interesting that you say there's I'm from MIT, and in the Cambridge ecosystem, we have this tiny little bubble where nobody wants a job. Every student going to MIT, they all kind of want to start a company. That said, I do think that there's a lot of confusion between terms, and I want to just t take two seconds and talk about invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship and how they're different. Um, at MIT, where there's so much technology floating around, a lot of students have this tendency to believe that invention alone is innovation. They go into the lab, they make something really amazing, and 
they file a patent and they think they're done. To me, that's not enough. I think innovation really has to have the concept of commercialization baked into it, and innovation really is um, invention coupled with commercialization. And when you do that in the context of a brand new venture, either starting a new company or starting a new business in the context of a big company, that's innovation. Um, I'd like to tell the story of a student team just to show how this one team took an idea from a technology to invention to innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, may I have the picture, please? Um, is the picture up? Okay, I'm just going to keep talking. So, <laughs> so four or five years ago, there were two PhD students uh, by the name of Maher and Karim, and they had met in Professor Varanasi's lab with a joint research interest, which is they wanted to look into ways of addressing the water shortage problem in the U.S. So they began looking at various technologies to increase water supply, and in about a year, they got something working where they're able to collect water from natural fog, so they thought that was pretty interesting. Perhaps we can start a business where we make water out of fog in water-scarce areas. At that point, that is a technology and an invention. It's not really you know, focused enough to fund a business yet. They decided to go and take an entrepreneurship class in which they looked at both the supply of water and also how water is used and immediately came to the realization that Half the water in the U.S. that's used every day is used by power plants. Power plants use 139 billion gallons of water every day to cool their processes. And that's like over five, that's 526 billion liters every day. It's crazy. So they realized that the technology they came up with could work with the plumes that come off of these wet cooling towers. This picture is um, a picture of wet cooling towers, and what happens is that a lot of the water that uh, thermoelectric power plants use is actually released into the atmosphere and lost. So they spend the next couple of years developing a device that is a mesh-based dome that could be retrofitted on top of these uh, wet cooling towers. Between that and also an electric field, they're able to charge the water so that when the water hits the mesh, is redirected back down to a water collector. And they're able to save 20 to 30 percent of the water that uh, an average power plant would consume. And for a 250 megawatt power plant, that's $1 million of savings each year. At this point, it could be an innovation, right? Because there is now a business case, but it's not a business yet. Now, they could have stopped there, written their thesis, and gone on to graduate. It would have been great. They would file some patents. It's innovative, but that's not enough for them either. They wanted to be the ones to bring this to market because they're really passionate about solving the water shortage problem. So subsequently, they incorporated their company. They went out there and started building this business. They joined our um, summer startup accelerator. I'm with the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, and we teach student teams how to start startups. They joined our accelerator, came through the summer, and they're going to graduate this year, and they are now piloting this solution in the power plant and are in talks with many other power plants to do more pilots. They've won a bunch of grant money, and they're going to go out there and do it. And I think that's the difference between invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. When the inventor takes it upon themselves to get in the driver's seat and build a new and sustainable business to solve a real problem for real people, that's uh, innovation-driven entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Elaine. That was really interesting. Conrad. Hi. So what is, what is your take? You're the entrepreneur on the, on the panel today. Thank you. Oh, should I switch now? Hi, uh, thank you. Nice to meet you all. Well, what do I know? Uh, except for building like more than 10 companies and, and uh, sold more than 20 million products in, in the world. I think it's, uh, it's pretty easy uh, when you do it the right way. Uh, one thing that didn't work when I was young is that you were kind of bullied 
if you were an entrepreneur, and I actually didn't understand the wording entrepreneur and innovation until I was over the 30s. Because uh, in my neighborhood, it was something that was not that nice. So it's a, it, it, first, I think it's a mentality change. And, and to have the mentality change, you need to put it into the education at an early stage. That is something natural, that people should make business and people should innovate. And, and, and you know, one way that I learned to become successful, successful was through failing. So failing is the way to success and it, it needs to be ways of helping the people who sometimes fail because the idea can often be right but you can be before, can be before your time and not having the support to, to uh, contribute and, and, and make this and then someone else will come and take the idea and so on. But that's, that's fine because the people that are creative and making new businesses usually find new businesses again. But it's all about a lot of learning. And if you could start that early in school, I think that would be very, very important. Another problem is that if you're making a business or an innovation, you might not have the people in the country where you're living. And there, even with the EU, there are still barriers uh, on how to get good educated people on the movement that you're starting on the, that project. So we need to find ways where people can go and work all over the world depending on where they can find their, their fantastic and ma magnificent uh, job and, and be part of that big innovation. Uh, when you innovate, it's not all, always about doing the big steps. Sometimes you can put one and one together and it becomes six. Uh, that is also one thing that I think should be put in that sometimes you put the barrier too high instead of you know thinking in, in, in the small steps of, of, of being innovative. Uh, and you need to learn somehow to, be, to have a vision, to have a dream, to become a global company and see how you can, how you can uh, uh, how you can become successful with your ID and that also comes in you know with the creativity but at the same time it's always the business I mean if you don't make money you're not uh, uh, you're not gonna survive so it's it's kind of being a for a herde what is that called shepherd. a shepherd you know uh, you cannot only be good in design or you cannot only be good in in, in marketing you need to be good in all the different tasks as a company holds with the different departments in order to, to be successful in the end. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a little bit, but small steps and education and, and, and basically being respected as an entrepreneur and an innovator. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, Conrad. So, I think it's interesting in regards to the, the border crossings. I think that is an important issue. I could totally agree with you on that. Yeah, you know, put one plus one together and make it six. So, Tom, what is your take on, on the need for regulation or deregulation? Sure. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to, to join you here. So. I work with a firm called Atomico, um, and Atomico is a venture capital firm. We're based in London, and we're investing into private technology startups across Europe. Um, and so that's the exposure that I have to entrepreneurship and, and innovation. And I want to start, actually, um, and pick up on a comment that you said, Jonas, which was, there's no innovation in Europe. Um, so I'm going to say, this is not the world that I know at all. And in fact, when I look at technology and how it has been developing and, and the role that it's been playing in innovation here in Europe, we have made incredible leaps forward. Uh, there has been huge progress in our technology ecosystem here today is unrecognizable compared to where it was a decade ago. It was just a few years ago, I think, where people did question whether entrepreneurs from Europe could build huge, globally meaningful and valuable companies. Um, and just in the last 10 years, we've seen more than 60 companies go on to achieve 
billion dollar valuations or more, which is a, you know, often seen as a sort of milestone of, of success. So I think you know, we do see that there is huge levels of innovation happening. That being said, there is more that we can do to foster um, entrepreneurship and innovation here in Europe. And you asked me to talk a little bit about regulation. And, and so people are probably used to hearing venture capitalists take a stance against regulation. You know, we're the people that back the companies that ignore regulation. We invest in companies that move fast and break things. And we, um, we, uh, we don't ask for permission and we seek forgiveness later. Well, look, I'm going to be, you know, a contrarian and say, well, actually, now is the time for more regulation. And I should say, now is the time for smart, scalable, proactive regulation. And I think we spend a long time thinking about regulation almost as this defense mechanism. It's a way for us to try to correct mistakes that we've made in the past. It's a way to protect against giant technology um, companies that are forming monopolies or a way to protect against invasions into privacies. And those things are important. But I think it's also important that we make sure that it doesn't become all-consuming of our efforts at the regulatory level. Because I think that if it does, it will come at the expense of giving ourselves an opportunity to use regulation not to go on the defense, but rather to go on the offense. And what do I mean by that? I mean using regulation as a forward-looking and proactive tool to help us to empower um, entrepreneurs using technology and to help to create an environment that will allow entrepreneurs to thrive, whether in Europe or beyond. And I think, you know, I say this at a time when it's pretty clear that um, attitudes around regulation <coughs> are shifting. Anyone who turned the news on this morning or watched last night, you know, saw that that was um, the case. And this idea of moving fast and breaking things, you know, it, I think people see that that, um, particularly as it applies to heavily regulated industries and particularly as technology becomes relevant in healthcare and education and transport and other industries, it's less and less relevant. So what we think is happening is when we speak to founders um, and when we engage with different groups of stakeholders, we say, well, let's stop looking at regulation as this kind of handcuff and use it as a source of competitive advantage. And when we look at the company level, the industry level, the city level, the country level, the regional level, the global level, we see that regulation can be this tool to help to drive entrepreneurship, to help to drive investment, to help to create jobs, to help to create value economically and socially. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there are, there are some really important uh, sort of, there's, a, there's an urgency here because when you think about the technologies that are set to define the next decade that will be the key drivers of innovation and entrepreneurship going forward, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's autonomous vehicles, whether it's robots and drones and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft or cryptocurrencies, these will all require updates to the regulatory frameworks that we have today in order to be commercialized and in order to reach their full potential. And here there's a real opportunity for, you know, for, for countries, for regions, or for us on a global level to move first to create the right conditions that can allow our entrepreneurs to apply those technologies and take on big societal challenges. And we think it's particularly important because when you look at the big macro challenges that we face, whether it's healthcare provision or food sustainability or carbon emissions, the reality today is that you know, these cannot be tackled by governments alone. We believe very firmly that this is now the age of the entrepreneur. And it is the entrepreneur who is most likely going forward to be um, the source of change, to be the person or the people that ultimately can bend the curves um, in the right direction in terms of you know, death from, via, uh, from, from uh, you know, climate change or in terms of challenging, uh, addressing the challenges that we face around food sustainability. And we see, you know, whether it's in the companies that we've invested in or, or across Europe as a whole, Companies like Farm Drop and Memphis Meats, who are addressing the supply chain issues in, in food, or Lilium, who are helping to create electric transport um, forms, or Hinge Health, who are helping to drive cheaper healthcare with better outcomes. You know, there are countless examples of incredible innovation happening from here in Europe. And 
we believe that you know, to really embrace the opportunity, we need governments, whether in Europe or beyond, to turn what are active discussions and consultations into real new regulatory frameworks. And by doing so, we can sort of you know, seize the opportunity is, that is at hand. Well, thank you so much, Tom. I will get back and sure. hack on you a little bit after everybody has done their intro. So, uh, Mia, would you like to talk a little bit about Ideon and what you guys are doing in regards to partnerships and creation? Yes, thank you. Um, just for those who don't know anything about uh, us, uh, Ideon Science Park is placed in, in Sweden. Uh, in the north of Europe and in the south of Sweden, 30 minutes from Dan uh, Denmark and Copenhagen. We have uh, an area um, which is uh, just next to the University of Lund uh, with 40,000 students and, and the new uh, European Spallation Source being built and the uh, MAX4 Synchrotron Laboratory. And we have 400 companies in the park. 60 or 70 of those are startups in any of our incubator systems. Um, but we also have the whole scale from micro to mid size to very large companies, as you can see. Um, sorry, Sweden uh, is uh, usually uh, ranked as second in the world when it comes to innovation. And I can promise you that we don't uh, rank as highly in commercialization. So this is our challenge. We need to bring our innovations out into the world. And I, I think that uh, I, I agree uh, partly with uh, Jonas when he says we need new partnerships uh, for more innovations to happen. And that's actually emphasizing what you said about uh, uh, innovations is also bringing the innovations out in the world. Uh, yes, I skipped that. No? Okay, but here are some innovations that has uh, been born in the uh, Ideon Science Park. The Ericsson and, and uh, later uh, Sony mobile phones, the Bluetooth uh, technology and, and, co and uh, Brave partnership, uh, the Gambro um, facilitations or technology for artificial kidney systems, uh, the ability to uh, send an image over the phones which uh, actually developed already in 1995 when the phones were looking like in the, in the top left uh, a picture and uh, the ability to uh, connect um, network connect um, video cameras to ensure uh, greater security and uh, and uh, click as uh, many of you might uh, use uh, as, a, as top managers um, as a business intelligence but I would like to say we didn't start that way. In the late 70s, there was a huge crisis in the south of Sweden. Thousands of people were unemployed, and uh, we had fairly low education in that part of the, of the country. And uh, it took many years to figure out what to do to end up uh, in the bottom of the economic uh, ranking. And that forced actually uh, us to, to enter into a partner uh, a partnership with public public sorry public and private uh, players, so the university uh, the the local and national government uh, took hands with great uh, uh, private companies like IKEA Ericsson Pashdorp and actually ICEA to start the first uh, science park in Scandinavia and the second in Europe. And brave cooperations like this is actually a success factor for the park and the region as of today. Oh, sorry. And I would like to say that why do we need these three entities to work together? Well, uh, in deep tech innovations need, uh, need skills, time and money. Uh, and a worldview of what is actually needed out there in the society. Um, universities uh, are great at skills development and science projects, but they're not so great at uh, actually creating commercialization. Uh, so we need the private companies to do that, or entrepreneurs. But the, the, we cannot trust the private companies to, um, uh, well, they, they cannot endure the long-term science projects or the skill development needed to really have deep innovations. Uh, 
so we need the universities for that. But then, on the other hand, we cannot trust the private companies to set out the direction for what is needed in the society uh, totally alone. Uh, and that's why we need a governmental view of this. And, and it, today, when we're more international than ever, I think that UN is playing a very important role in this. Uh, so we all need to get uh, to work together to find uh, ways forward and, and uh, face the challenges of the today. Uh, a few times a year to practice how we actually have the process in the park, how we move past the ball between us to reach uh, higher goals. Another example is that, uh, and this is completely new for the Swedish National Energy Agency, to work with uh, eight environments as the local uh, network of private, large companies, small, medium-sized companies, innovations, and the University for Scientific uh, Innovations. And we work together as a team to produce, to find uh, energy-related uh, innovations and make them understand that if they qualify in, a, in a, some certain ways, they can be funded by the National Agency for Energy. And that covers all from validation to commercialization and internationalization. Uh, I'll skip that part. We also work with open innovation. And what we're doing now is actually uh, trying to take public-private partnerships. Yay! I did it. <laughs> uh, to, into, uh, out into the world. And, and uh, what we're actually doing from, from uh, the science park, which is privately and semi-privately owned, we're helping the government of Indonesia to create science parks with idea as a model. We're helping Nigeria to uh, set up a science park and uh, an incubator. Uh, and this is partnerships. We're not doing this because we're nice. We see uh, that they have large markets. I mean, in, in Sweden, we're 9 million people. They have large markets, English-speaking people, internet-penetrated uh, 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 customers that we want to reach. And his, this is a, a lovely picture from where Idea and Science Park uh, uh, consultant is actually one in the team in Nigeria, uh, in the Roar Nigeria incubator. So thanks for that. Uh, we try to stay entrepreneurial uh, and even so try to create new innovations, Jonas. Thank you. Thank you so much. So then I will throw this over to Norway and Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Um, we are innovative in Norway. <laughs> uh, I come from Innovation Norway. We are the governmental instrument for value creation in Norway. And uh, I work in a team where we are mandated uh, by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to contribute to humanitarian innovation. So this is quite uh, difficult for many reasons and really, really meaningful and interesting work. So our point of starter is the challenge of 50% uh, finance gap in the sector, which all of you also, I guess, uh, are facing daily in your work. And uh, we have been asked to see how can our work contribute to minor that gap by uh, fostering innovative partnerships within or among uh, the UN agencies and NGOs on the one side and the uh, private sector on the other. And we're not alone in doing this. Many others are doing, but I think we're one of the few governmental in, uh, institutions doing this towards this sector. So, uh, so <laughs> I had to put my notes on. Oh, oh my God, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, how do we do it? We finance uh, UN agencies uh, with innovation uh, funding to partner up with private sector. What we see so far is that, I agree with you, that there are not many innovations because there's a lot of incentives and money put into innovations, but the outcome of it, it's still not very good. And uh, I think uh, there 
the challenges are both on the UN organizational side and on the private sector side. And I'm an anthropologist, so my, I'm great at looking, <laughs> observing uh, the diversity and the difficulties in this. Uh, so I just want to put out some uh, thoughts I've had on working on this area for some time. And I think from the humanitarian side, I'm not really sure if you're welcoming the private sector. I, I mean, you want them to be there because you need to. It's a finance gap and you need private sector solutions for your ability to work in the field and de deliver on your mandate. But apart from that, I'm not really sure if you want them to be your friend or be your partner. Uh, and for, for good reasons. Because private sector are very, very different and they might actually put you out of business. And that is, uh, <laughs> and that is I mean, if that was my job, I would be scared as well. And uh, I think uh, it's, uh, although, I mean, the typical rhetorics of is to, I want to be put out of business, but I don't think that's the reality. And I don't think you ever will. So I think you should rather start thinking of how can we always be relevant in a world filled of conflict, disasters, and crisis, because it will never disappear. So I think it's about uh, afraid of losing mandates, roles, and activities. And it's also about being uh, afraid of the unknown consequences of bringing private sector into the field. And also for good reasons, because we're talking about humanitarian crisis, and how can you do failure in innovation uh, projects when we don't really know the consequences of a pilot. It is scary and it is dangerous. And it's, so it's very, very understandable. So for that reason, I also understand why you, not all of you, but I can see as a tendency, uh, maybe you don't want them to be part, partner as such. And from the private sector part, uh, they are very often undermining the complexity of the humanitarian sector. They're quick, they have uh, quick solutions, they have great solutions, and they think that the UN, the governments and all of them are making too many problems. And they're, in, in that regard, not taking the complexity into the, into the partnership. And by doing that, they are not uh, working with the complexity, they are uh, making uh, it more difficult to succeed in my view. And it's also from the private sector side, uh, from my experience, a lack of uh, the knowledge of the humanitarian ecosystem. You have all the, for example, in, uh, impact investors now, they say everything should be uh, uh, <laughs> startups and it should be entrepreneurial. But it's like, hello, have you seen how the humanitarian system works? Do you know how it works? And they don't. So, or, you know, overall. Um, so what we have been working now on for a couple of years is to, to see how can we then make these uh, partnerships that are so different, but yet they need each other. And uh, we are getting there, we are getting better, and we are working a lot on the competence on both sides. It's like being an anthropologist, you, know, you have to learn about each other's worldviews, cosmology, values, and so on, and uh, to create a trust, because I heard uh, uh, people before here today also mentioned that there is a lack of trust in the, part in the partnerships, and, and it, uh, it's understandable. But I think uh, we need to then create the trust by competence, and we need to... Uh, do what uh, the Norwegian sociologist Galtung is saying, bake a new cake. Don't uh, fight over the old cake, bake a new one. And find that space where you can actually go into the new kitchen and bake the cake together. Don't compromise on your values, don't compromise on your mandates, but see how can we find that common space where we can be uh, creative and, and uh, actually go towards the common goals. So uh, that will be my uh, introductionary uh, talks. We, we finance uh, 11 innovation projects from the UN agencies uh, this year, together with private sector. So we are, we are hands-on on it. We are work, walking the talk, and uh, it's, a, it's a long way to go, and uh, it's great, great work. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was really interesting. So uh, final, but not last <laughs> uh, Ruiz
Would you like to step in to the discussion as well? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I'd like to build on, on what both um, Elizabeth and, and Mia suggested. Um, and obviously, as a representative from the NGO sector, I would say this. Um, but when you're creating partnerships that, that are looking to try and innovate and tackle some of the world's biggest sustainability issues, I think you really need to think strategically about how you can include NGOs from the outset in those partnerships. And I appreciate that probably sounds a little unusual at a conference where we're specifically looking at public and private sector partnerships to be talking about, well, actually, there's, there's a whole third sector that you need to bring in. Um, but I think that you're missing a trick if you don't. Um, and I'll explain why. I think a lot of the sort of, I guess, seemingly intractable big social, political, environmental problems, or the macro problems, as you called them, Tom, that we're experiencing at the moment. So everything from climate change to sort of entrenched world poverty. We've had a fair bash at using these sort of top-down, expert-led approaches at tackling them. Um, and they've got us really far. I'm not denying that there has been progress, and there's still a lot of progress that can be made that way. And these are the approaches that I think um, the public sector are absolutely brilliant at fostering and the private sector are fantastic at supporting. Um, but I think we're missing a low hanging fruit if we don't bring in the NGO sector to sort of support some of these. Um, and I think the low hanging fruit um, in this sense is that the expertise that we can bring in um, the, the sort of ideas that we can unlock will actually come from involving communities and people living at the absolute coalface of these problems. So the people who live poverty, the people who live the effects of climate change day in and day out. If we can bring them in um, and support them to help co-create some of the solutions to become the inventors um, and hopefully the entrepreneurs to sort of bring forward um, some of this innovation, then actually I think we're going to see some, some real jumps and some leaps and bounds in a lot of the ways that we address some of the world's biggest sustainability problems. And what's this got to do with NGOs? Um, well, fortunately for us, or for me from my sector, um, working with communities at the coalface of these problems tends to be our bread and butter. These tend to be the beneficiaries who we work with absolutely day in and day out. And I understand that this isn't every NGO, um, and there's a, you know, well, there's a broader push for NGOs to work in this direction that's more participatory and more inclusive, um, and some NGOs are a lot further along in their journey than, than others. I think if you can find the right NGO partner, if you can find the right NGO that works with these communities, that can bring these people with this lived, latent knowledge to the table to have these discussions, then actually what you're going to find um, is that a lot of, a lot of innovations a lot of um, entrepreneurship will start in these regions and will really meaningfully address problems um, in ways that these sort of top-down expert-led approaches couldn't have even imagined possible um, without bringing that, that collective lived experience to the table. Um, and so I think while it's, it's fantastic that we're talking about how we can bring universities on, how we can bring science parks on board. Um, I think what we need to also start thinking about is how can we bring grassroots communities to the table as well? Because at the end of the day, they're going to be the ones who can benefit if we can tackle some of these huge issues. Um, and also, they will know how to do it. They've got a litany of ideas that they're just dying to try, that they just haven't had the support or the resources to, to attempt. Um, and I think that, you know, among ourselves here, we can be um, huge sort of players in trying to bring that expertise to the table. Thank you, Ruth. So before I start uh, attacking Tom over there in the corner, <laughs> maybe someone else wants to start asking some questions to the other panelists. Um. I want to make a, uh, to agree on your point on uh, including uh, the grassroots, and uh, that's also what we do in um, in our innovation program. Um, and I think that is uh, very important to uh, highlight uh, to the private sector as well, because it's uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm also an entrepreneur. You really believe in your idea. If you don't, you will never make it. So, and that also make might make it a bit uh, uh, difficult to also see the actual needs on the ground. So I, I would just want to really agree with you on that point. Very, very important. Yeah. 
Yes, I have a question uh, for for uh, Rice or uh, Reese. Reese. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, when you're talking about NGOs, what kind of uh, communities are you are you do you have in mind? Because um, I'm, I'm, me myself, I'm a Rotarian, and I think I know that the Rotary International is is covered uh, all over the world and doing fantastic jobs. And uh, so, uh, so uh, it's important also to find the right ones to work with, right? And uh, so, what's your, what are your? Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. Um, I think that that can be one of the most difficult things if you're trying to start a partnership and you're looking for an NGO partner from the beginning because it's an absolutely huge sector. I mean, I know um, in the UK alone there's sort of £63 billion worth of activity and the UK is quite small. If you look at the US, there's $370 worth of, uh, billion dollars worth of activity that happens every year. So you've got this huge pool of activity representing you know, global um, projects that are deeply complex and you know it can take some time to find the right partnership but there, there genuinely are NGOs out there um, that are doing incredible work um, supporting pretty much any marginalised community you can think of around the world there will be an NGO that's networked with them that's working in a really supportive and empowering way. I think one of the difficulties is that there's a lot of NGOs out there that are you know have quite traditional almost um, you know, a, a Victorian idea around what their role is and their role is very much to ameliorate problems and, you know, we help people by doing this for them. Um, and actually working with those sort of NGOs isn't going to bring much to the table if you're looking for, for new ideas and new energy. What you need to try and find is some of the, the NGOs that are a bit more you know, to steal the word, and I'm sure you'll um, be very angry at me, Elaine, for, for misusing it, but that are innovating in the NGO sphere um, by actually seeing their role as creating a voice and amplifying the thoughts and the understandings of their beneficiary communities rather than being the, the NGOs that usurp their voice or do work on their behalf. Um, but there are absolutely loads of them. They tend to be a lot of the kind of um, newer, smaller NGOs tend to be um, a lot more connected to the grassroots. Um, but you, you know, that's, that's a, a huge generalisation. There's, there's really um, glaring emissions there. Um, but you can absolutely find the right NGO um, by having a few conversations and seeing, you know, is participation, is inclusion built through its DNA? Does its board reflect the diversity of what it's talking about? Um, what are its work practices? And if you can do that, pretty much any innovation you want to make, you'll be able to find someone who can bring to the table an entire community, an entire grassroots, you know, a, a village of ideas rather than just one or two players. Okay, so um, I'd like to ask a question in a completely different direction. Um, Conrad, you uh, mentioned that, you know, the notion of embracing failure or failing fast, and that's very much our mantra, because in the startup, if you're not failing five times every day and twice as much on Sundays, I think you've failed. And yet, Elizabeth says, when you don't know the consequence of failure, it's kind of really scary to fail. So what, what are your thoughts on that and also a cross-cultural um, boundaries because I come from a Chinese culture and my culture doesn't really embrace failure. Just saying. <laughs> well, thank you for the question because I think there are some uh, uh, things you can do. And uh, in the humanitarian sector, for example, where we work, uh, you have uh, UN agencies and organizations who are so very well managing the refugee situation within very controlled spheres. So actually doing, for example, piloting within these uh, already existing programs and where it's functioning very well, we believe it's also a way of de-risking the piloting. Uh, so you do it within the established uh, structures and you do it with uh, beneficiaries who are able to, to you know, be, be part of the piloting as well and be, uh, be relevant partners as well. So, so we see that uh, this is absolutely possible and you ha I see World Food Programme is here, they have done fantastic work on innovation on the blockchain uh, uh, projects in Jordan on, uh, on the digital payments. So, 
uh, I don't know how many there are now, <laughs> probably also, but it's like 500,000 people or something you're scaling now to be part of that project. So it's really to using the established, structure, uh, established uh, structures, I think, is the way to go, at least in, in these humanitarian uh, uh, fields. But for China, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I, I don't have any empirical uh, <laughs> experience. From from my part, it has been you know usually when you fail, that's when the good ideas come. Uh, that you find new solutions in in uh, in a way that is way more innovative. But you have to be uh, uh, very passionate and and also strong and brave in order to do these uh, failures. But for for us, I mean, we 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 sold these 20 million products in in seven years in 125 different countries. Uh, and it's, it's shitloads of products, but the big thing has been that we, we surf the different waves of new innovative technology. So first when we did the headphones, we put on a microphone. We came in from the design angle and made it look different and, and nice, but then we, put, we were the first ones in the world to put microphones on all headphones. And with the mobile revolution, like 10 years ago, iPhone coming and these ones, everybody wanted, uh, needed a microphone to have a better user experience. And after that, everybody put all the music when it was digital into the phone, so we made amplified speakers. So when you came home, you could play from the phone. And after that, we've been doing it. My latest project is uh, Tesla on water, where I build 100% electric, electric boats. So it's, you know, it's a constant evolution in using today's technology, but it's amazing how much more sustainability um, products that is coming, you know, materials and so on, and uh, at the same time, things that you can use for, for innovation. So it's not e doing everything from scratch. Sometimes you can surf the wave of, of others as well on, on, on the global transition. Maybe Jonas, if I if I can, before before you before you come and attack me, um, I, so just kind of going back to this idea of, of fear of failure, and, and actually I think this is one of the the sort of softer dimensions where actually we have made progress here in Europe, and um, I just want to spend a few moments to think about some of the specific aspects of well, what is it that people fear? What what is it that they're afraid of? And I think. I don't have the complete answer, but I think a couple of the things to think about are, well, people are worried about their, you know, their reputation and the expectations that people around have of them. Um, particularly, they, they're worried about what their parents might think, um, depending on, on their age. And, you know, I think a, a, a big change that has happened is that we have now increasingly made entrepreneurship sort of pass the parent test. It, um, and I, I think you know, one of the things that has been most influential and I think is really, really important is making sure that we showcase role models. And we, we, we both showcase the role models that have succeeded, um, but we also ask them to talk about the, you know, the, the journeys that they've um, had on the way to success. And you will, I, you know, I'd be willing to bet, you will find very few that, that didn't fail you know, as you said, multiple times along the way. And so really being open and talking about it is something that I think helps to address that sort of reputation um, challenge. And then I think on the other side, it's, it's the fears of, well, what happens if? You know, what happens if my business doesn't succeed? What are the financial burdens that, that I may face? What are the administrative burdens that I may face in, in sort of you know, bringing that business to an end? And I think here, we see in too many countries that the red tape that um, exists around um, closing down a business is still too great, and that that creates you know barriers in people's minds. Well, it's like you know actually if I if there is such a high probability that that I fail, then you know what it's not worth the uh, the, the risk because it's you know I, I'm going to you know, have to go through this incredibly arduous and potentially costly process to just close down my business, and so I think. There are, you know, in the U.S., we can we can look to the progress that they've made there to to really try to, you know, simplify that process too. 
Just want to add to that that in the, in the Silicon Valley they don't speak about failures; they speak about shortfalls. So it's just a shortfall, and you make a lot of shortfalls on the way to success. And I'm trying to implement that in in the park actually. That it's it's really important to make those shortfalls. We also have a hashtag called hashtag fail fast. We actually really like failing fast. <laughs> I think failure, failure is failure to learn. When you're a startup, you're an entrepreneur, and you're not testing your assumptions, and you take too long to build something, and then you never find out if you're right or not. I think that's the bigger failure in the startup context, right? Can I add to that? I mean, it's interesting hearing everyone talk about failure and, and how the, the culture is moving to, you know, it, it's acceptable to fail really quickly um, and the role that regulation can play in that. Um, from the NGO perspective, um, the regulations that NGOs have globally make it almost impossible to fail safely. Um, we have structures set up where, you know, um, your boards have to be incredibly risk adverse um, because they have a responsibility to the beneficiaries. Um, the funding environment is just so deeply competitive that you could never go back to a funder and say, hey, we tried something, but it didn't work, um, and that be acceptable. Um, and so I think actually, you know, as much as you're saying it's, it's a movement that needs to happen, that the, the private sector needs to be more okay with failing, I think the public sector and the NGO sector needs to even take the first step on that journey um, because there's such huge barriers for us. Yeah, I, I would like to challenge the panel to move a little bit away from entrepreneurship when we talk about innovation. And I have listened many things here that are very interesting about commercialization, like uh, station innovation, finance gap, learning for failure, and regulation and community involvement. But let's say that from a European point of view, there is like a kind of a clear a challenge that some of the SDGs just can be faced by a system innovation logic. So we need to have like a vision about the system that we want to have in 20 years. So this is a different type of discussion. And actually, I just want to mention one of the initiatives in Europe. I'm not representing Europe, but there is this big funding on smart specialization. That means how all the actors move together to a vision on what can be good for industry and community in 20 years' time. So how we agree about how we can challenge uh, uh, CO2 emissions, energy, health, in a kind of more macro discussion, and this is about public-private partnership. So I think I just challenge you to think about how we can think in public-private partnership as an instrument to collaborate to get that vision to achieve these goals and not just thinking in the kind of macro or experimental elements. I think that's a really good commentary and a good question as well. Uh, for, from my perspective, doing research on this at the moment, uh, we need to take back the definitions. We have to make people stop misusing the words innovation and disruption and not put it on things that are not. I mean, uh, in the 1990s, they were called management consultants. Today, we call them innovation consultants. And, so, and like for a few months be in between, they were called change consultants. I don't care if they're ch called change consultants, but man, if I have you in my network on LinkedIn, I will go after you if you call yourself innovation consultant. Um, because I think that's where we devaluate the meaning of it. I don't know if, if anyone here ag agrees with that. I, I have a, a slightly different answer on, 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 on the thing, but it's also on, I mean, in, in, in the end of the day, a business needs to make money. That is the first thing you need to learn. So. It has to do with the culture in the company. If you, if you learn to lose a lot of money and, and somebody helps you, you, you will have had very hard to change the culture to becoming a profitable company. And we need profitable companies in the end. The second one, when I started the company that uh, is Sound Industries, um, we are Sweden's quickest growing company in history according to the business magazine Dagens Industry. Uh, that's been profitable since day one. Uh, you know, the innovative circle of uh, 
the government wouldn't give us any money because they said that I wasn't well educated enough and I couldn't fill in the papers. And that was after they asked me to give a speech at their convention of 10 years. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I didn't want to do it because I said in the company, like, to my, to my colleagues that we just need to do this and show them that we can design nice products and we can do the back end to sell products and ship it all over the globe. And then everybody, everything is going to be fine. Don't worry about this administration on the side because, you know, that is, uh, you know, n not for real in one way. But the regulations that needs to be is that you can get the right people into your company. I have many people that can't come and work for me that I really need to be successful. So, I mean, it's always different. And, and there is different of different businesses. I'm in one kind of business, so I can't talk about all businesses because in research and medical and, and software and so on, it, it, it's different. It's hard to be, be profitable since day one. But we were doing hardware. We're old school, so we could be. Um, so it's, it, it, this is not a easy task. It's, it's case by case, I would say. But I take it that you agree with Elaine's view that uh, innovation needs to make money, otherwise it's not innovation, it's just some boring invention. <laughs> Which also makes it difficult to partner up with UN agencies and uh, NGOs because they don't want you to make money. And that is a, <laughs> it is a huge problem. And uh, then again, I want to say bake the new cake, because then you can look at other uh, uh, aspects of the collaboration where you want the same thing. And I think that's important. I also just want to follow up on your uh, uh, hypothesis about uh, innovation consultants. And I think uh, in particular in the UN humanitarian system, that is an issue because so much governmental money is now put into innovation uh, incentives. And s so everyone's doing innovation. And uh, some of us feel like we need to be a gatekeeper <laughs> to innovation. And it is a, it is a um, problem because this is the uh, window opening for innovation for the first time. I've been working on these issues for 20 years. For the first time, we have money and mandate to do this. And I, we don't want it to be spoiled by adjustments or progression, which is needed, but it's not innovation. Can I just ask, and again, this is a genuine question. I appreciate it's going to seem um, uh, like I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate. Um, but I, I mean, I've listened to, to both ends of the spectrum here, and it, it's an honest question, and I would say this. Is there a role for innovation without profit? I mean, is there, is there some way we can solve some of the world's biggest problems and, and innovate new solutions for it without profit having to be the driving motive? I, I would say that any disruptive innovation has never made a profit. The first entry never makes money. I know people call Facebook and Google disruptive and innovative. They were like so far from being the first entry, they're not even on the top 10 list. If you look at Spotify, I mean, were they like 15 years after Napster? So if we, if we look at that, of course you can have innovation without making money. But can you have entrepreneurship and drive a company? No. Um, it, sorry. It, uh, yeah. So I just want to comment on the making money. Um, making money doesn't have to be evil, right? <laughs> Not everyone's Google. Just saying, you could have a social venture that is sustainable, and the goal is to make enough money so you can reinvest and do meaningful things to solve real problems for real people. We have a lot of B corporations um, at MIT, actually, uh, that's trying to do this, being a for-profit company that also has a cost that they're trying to solve, right? So making money does not have to be evil, but you do need to be sustainable yeah. so that you can keep doing the meaningful things they're doing for people, right? Good. So may maybe if I can, then, then I'm going to jump in and... I, I don't think I know what the definition of a public-private partnership is, um, but I, I'm going to give a couple of examples that I think speak to the opportunities to bring the private and public sector together and also speak to the opportunities to create a profit whilst also making sustain, uh, meaningful impacts on big sustainability goals. And um, from within our portfolio, we have a company called OFO, 
Um, they are based out of Beijing, actually, and they are a bike sharing network. So they have um, created a platform to allow people to uh, to pick up a bike from anywhere in the city and drop it off. Um, and they are creating a sustainable business, sustainable from the profit um, perspective. They are working hand in hand together with cities all around the world to roll out their services. So the partnership is there. And they're also making incredible differences, uh, differences to um, big problems that we have because they have helped to drive a 5% reduction in um, vehicle, so car miles traveled within certain cities. They have helped to drive a 5% reduction in diesel and petrol sales. And as a result, helped to drive a you know, similar level of um, decline in terms of carbon emission in those cities. So there absolutely are um, examples where all of these things are coming together and everybody wins. And, you know, I can speak about Memphis Meats who are um, creating um, sustainable meat. Or I can talk about Cree from Sweden who are helping to deliver access to healthcare at a fifth of the cost of traditional means, but with better outcomes, better outcomes for patients and better outcomes for doctors and better outcomes for governments. So um, I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> All right, so it's my turn now to go after you a little bit there, Tom. So let's go back to the definition of innovation. Do you see Cree as innovation? Does it matter? Does it matter? I mean, I think, look, what, is the, what ultimately is the definition of success? You know, what are we, what are we really talking about here? And, you know, does, does it matter if it's innovation or if it's applying somebody else's innovation, commercializing it and helping it to reach initially millions and potentially tens of millions of people and make a difference for all of them. I, 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 I sort of challenge the initial premise of the question, to be honest. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. No, my, my point is simple. Um, it is clear that there has to be a profit incentive in any private public partnership. Oh, I, I could say it too. <laughs> Um, and, and I think that's one of the issues that we have within the UN system is that we are not good enough in explaining that actually we can allow that. Uh, but when it comes to innovation, which is perhaps even more important <laughs> then the definition of the word has to be what it is. We can't just like roll the word around and have it watered down to like, you know, like there was the, the, the biggest me online medical service started in the U.S. I think 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, the, the founder of that company is, is now retired. Uh, let, let me come to another example then that I think genuinely is innovation, but which is taking innovation into uh, entrepreneur, you know, the path of entrepreneurship and now seeking to commercialize it. And uh, we have an investment in a company called Lilium, who are you know, from Munich. And this is a great example of they are, you know, it's a company founded by four students from the Technical University of Munich, um, all working in different fields of engineering, who are coming together now to build um, a fully electric, fully autonomous, eventually personal aircraft that will take off and land um, vertically, and ultimately, um, you know, if they succeed, will completely transform. Um, the nature of transportation um, within and between cities. Um, and, you know, I think not only will they transform how we, um, how we move people, um, they will also have a huge impact um, in terms of uh, the environment because it's fully electric, so it will help to, you know, significantly cut um, you know, the emissions from existing forms of transportation. And way beyond that, you know, I think what's really exciting is that if you really drink the Kool-Aid and if you really believe in the vision that they're executing against, then they also have the potential to change how, we, you know, how and where we choose to live. And so by dramatically cutting the time that it will take to commute between, you know, long distances, they will make it possible for people to, you know, not have to come into our big cities and to potentially, you know, I'm not going to say they're going to reverse urbanization, but they will 
change how people think about the need to live in cities. And it's a great example of you know, how we're seeing incredible innovation emerge from, from Europe. And they will require strong partnership from the public sector because clearly the regulatory framework to allow that to happen today is not in place. And we right. need to, this is where we need to be proactive. So I would like to open up for the floor now if there are any questions. So let's start with WFP. Thank you. Um, so I'm Bernard. I'm the head of the Innovation Accelerator of the World Food Program. So thanks also, Elizabeth, for pointing out like the uh, Building Blocks blockchain project in Jordan. It's actually one of the, these innovations that have applied to our accelerator. It was one of our finance offices. We teamed him up with an external startup. And in six months, he implemented, like Human, our colleague, with one, the support of the accelerator, they implemented the blockchain solution as e-wallets for 10,500 people. It's right now at 100,000. Um, the, I, I think my, my comment is actually, and a couple of you mentioned this, um, regarding what's actually required for innovation. It's, I mean, the session is called Innovation and Partnerships. Um, uh, I think there was lots of reference made to you need to have uh, innovators, um, and um, it's something that Elaine mentioned, especially like, you know, this, the people who were like the university students that went to the accelerator that then were actually doing it. Um, from my uh, personal uh, experience, and I mean, we, we as Accelerator work both with external startups as well with internal UN teams. Um, the, I think the challenge is how do you really get stuff to scale? Um, in my personal uh, opinion, I would say actually the team is probably more important than any other factor, and I, I would just uh, want to also hear the panel's views on that. Um, and the second thing is, I mean, one of the uh, toolkits that we force entrepreneurs, both private sector or nonprofit entrepreneurs, as well as teams inside, is to use HCD, like design thinking, lean startup, to actually, not necessarily failing, but to test and experiment quickly so they can actually learn faster. Uh, and so that's my second question, if like, is that what you would support too, or is there any other things that you would advocate for in in terms of pushing things, specifically in, I mean, my, my world is developing countries, so it's not necessarily Western Europe, but would be curious to hear about from you. Thank you. So I'd like to start. Um, thank you for pointing out um, team and lean startup, Bernard. So first of all, team, yes, yes. The most important thing about the startup and whether or not it's likely to succeed is the team. We see a lot of startups every quarter. We see 300, 400 in my office alone. Um, and then we've got 20 plus uh, startups that go through our summer accelerator. The startups that don't go forward, most of the time they don't go forward because the team could not figure out how to be a co-founding team. and. Um, to that and the diversity um, um, aspect that Mia mentioned is really important. We see that a diverse team is a strong team, a team that can have multiple viewpoints that's really important. As for the lean startup um, design thinking, uh, I think there are multiple startup frameworks that all stress the same thing, which is first of all, start with the problem and then come up with the solution. Don't go backwards. And even with the technology-based startups such as the um, the, uh, you know, the plume uh, ablation startup that I mentioned, they had the technology, then they came back to the beginning and stayed in problem space. And that is the philosophy of design thinking with customer empathy. That is also um, where lean startup starts. And back to failure. Lean startup is a way to accelerate the build, measure, learn um, cycle where you take your assumptions and boil it down into testable bits and you go into the market and test as quickly as you can. This is easier done in a small company than a big company, so I very much understand um, you know, the challenges in government or in an NGO where it's very difficult to do that without consequences, but that's one of the strengths of being a, a brand new venture, um, you know, either as a startup or as an entrepreneurial venture, that you actually are able to do that quickly. Yes, I, I totally agree, uh, but I would like to add that um, if you're a, a large organization 
um, for instance, a, a, a private company or a, a, a public company that is a public organization that have many thousands of employees. You usually have your, you have been innovative long time ago and you've built up a way to move forward and you are now in silos and you have KPIs that tells you to do exactly the same as last year but a little bit better. And it's uh, tough in that environment to be really truly innovative. And uh, so to uh, meet this need and to create open innovation space, uh, we have actually uh, started an accelerator where large organizations can put R&D team or, or innovative team to learn from other entrepreneurs around them or innovators and uh, to be facilitated in this process, to, to leave uh, you know, the square behind them and try to open up to new uh, partnerships and diverse uh, uh, people. Thank you. I just want to bring that forward to uh, when it's not entrepreneurs, not startups in the innovation partnerships. I really believe the, um, uh, the team is still the core uh, issue, but we need to uh, use the concept of uh, trust. And we need to build a project group uh, or innovation group that has the same uh, trust embedded as uh, from the startup world. That is uh, my truly experience as well from innovation partnerships. I think uh, this is actually where innovation and, and business goes apart in, in some, some cases. Uh, because the government, uh, when they innovate, uh, the ones I have met, and of course it's not everybody, the, but you know, they have a vision on the innovation and not the commercial side of things uh, always. Uh, and then some companies can use it, but I think that you could speed it up uh, to make more money in, in good partnerships and, and see it and start these collaborations at the early stage. All right, next question. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers for the nice session and useful talks. Uh, actually, my question, I think, would be for Mia. Uh, as you mentioned, that universities cannot commerci uh, commercialize, and also we have problems that the private sections cannot endure long science projects. So from your experience, what do you think about the right and effective way to do innovation partnership between universities and uh, private sector? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, this is the trick, uh, uh, and there is not uh, one answer to this. Um, but um, um, I mean, perhaps we have been lucky also in uh, Sweden that we have um, very successful founders that have built up a pile of money. They're also uh, donating to to long-term science. We have the Wallenberg family and we have the Kamprad, the IKEA family, and, and we have Sten Koyun. So we have a lot of those uh, uh, formerly successful founders that put money back into science and leave them, uh, leave the money with the science for a long time. Because deep innovations, I agree with Jonas that if you really want to have something new coming out, it takes time and it takes money. So um, I, I wouldn't have the, the, the easy answer that if you take this and add this and then the right answer is. But they need to come together and, and, and see the, the mutual strengths. And, uh, and try to work, uh, where can we, can we uh, work on this science project for 10 years and then come back to you and you have a possibility to commercialize that. All right, so go over to Canada. Yes, my, uh, thank you very much. It was a wonderful discussion that uh, we all enjoyed. Uh, uh, my question is to Mia. Uh, uh, you reminded me that my 1980, at the end of 80 and uh, till end of 99, I was a student of Lund University. So I was observing all this uh, innovation, and the, the, the techniques of Edion. Uh, I was closely related to, but one thing I'm just trying to ask, the 
environmental condition, the impact of this partnership and innovation. So recently I observed in North American countries that Ericsson is passing a little bit crisis. So I want to just uh, get a little bit highlight from you that uh, what you might uh, uh, tell me the, how the impact of the environmental condition or competitors uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, slow down the partnership and innovation process, please. So just to understand the question, uh, the environmental yeah. uh, conditions are that there are more competitors in the neighborhood. Exactly. Yes, and that comes back to smart spe specialization, which I, uh, I actually uh, sometimes question. I think uh, that there needs to be some competitive uh, um, environment, but, uh, but uh, mainly uh, uh, work on the culture of openness and how to, can we actually uh, uh, solve this together. And, and a fine example was in 1998 when, uh, when Ericsson and Nokia, who were competitors, and Intel actually founded the Bluetooth uh, standardization. And I think we are in a time right now where more standardizations uh, would uh, need to take place. So I, I understand your question. But uh, I, I don't know if I'm answering it. Uh, I just want to say you, that... You, you answered it. I want to okay. make one more. <laughs> and I had uh, IAEA there, I think. We're a, a United Nations organization, a science and technology, to foster the use of nuclear science and applications. A big area is in cancer treatment and helping member states build cancer uh, treatment facilities. And it, as you know, that in the Millennium Development Goals now with, excuse me, the SDGs with the non-communicable diseases, um, cancer is now one of the, one of the priorities. Um, and my question, I'm listening to the panel, I'm just trying to think about it in the developing um, world context. One of the, we, we're looked to help with fostering innovation and one of the big gaps, for example, is technology used for cancer treatment in the Western world isn't really, um, it's either, it's expensive, um, it takes a, a, a large expensive framework infrastructure to utilize and um, we, we would like, we try, we've been trying to foster um, uh, developments with industry to come up with cheaper, lower tech uh, solutions. Um, and I'm just curious, I'm listening, it's, it is in a sense a, a new cake, um, or we're not sure we have everybody in the kitchen we need uh, to bake that cake. And I just, um, and I guess the challenge is there's real interest, but the perspective of when the returns would come on investing in a cheaper, simpler uh, instrumentation for very important, all the while people have, uh, uh, there's a growing number of people that need to be treated. So we're asking ourselves what, who we need to bring to the table to try to foster further innovation and get something quicker to the market. Thank you. So in, in whose interest is it to get the cost down? Is it in the medical companies? No. Is it in their shareholders? No. I mean, if we look at it, 80% of the medical uh, development costs in the U.S. is covered by the government. It's very similar or even more so here in Europe. Now, the medical companies, where do they register their patents? We're sitting in the country. They're registering it here in, in, in Switzerland. Who owns the, me the medical companies? The insurance industry, right? The pension funds. So to get anywhere... I think it's, it's a matter of forcing, forcing development. And then we go to the question of regulation, which uh, Tom touched before. I, I'm probably going to sound like a broken record, but um, you know, I think it's actually an incredibly exciting time um, if you look at the application of data and artificial intelligence within healthcare. And I think specifically in the field of cancer, um, which is, you know, of course, one of the biggest killers and one of the biggest cost drivers of uh, of, uh, of the healthcare systems globally. And um, whether it is in respect of better forms of treatment or whether it is in terms of better diagnostics um, and the ability to you know, catch uh, you know, potential cases of cancer much earlier and therefore dramatically increase the chances of being able to uh, you know, help that patient, we're seeing huge leaps forward and there are you know, numerous companies um, both from Europe as well as, um, uh, you know, from Silicon Valley who are um, 
who really see that there is um, a huge opportunity to, to uh, you know, to, to both create profitable, sustainable companies as well as um, have the chance to make a meaningful impact on the world by, uh, you know, really, really driving down um, death rates for, you know, for diseases like cancer. So we're, we're seeing that it's a, it's a huge focus for entrepreneurs today. All right, one last question, the gentleman over there. Interesting uh, session. I like the way even it's being managed. Thank you very much. My question, I do, whenever I go and make a talk about knowledge economy or innovation, in policymakers, government, they ask me, give us lessons learned, which countries we should learn from them. And I always to jump and say Scandinavian or maybe Sweden or maybe Denmark or sometimes Finland. Now, the question they ask me, what is Sweden has done we should do in order to be number two in innovation. So if there is any short answer, I can next time give it to a politician or a government official, rather than explain to him what is knowledge economy and all that stuff. You need ABBA. <laughs> and that, was, that was the birth of the Swedish music industry, and that's where you have a successful cluster created in Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been asked this question, why Sweden is good in innovation, and right. how do you answer it? I don't know. No, it's, it's, it's partly a combination of what I just said, random things that happen, like ABBA. And uh, the well, things that Mia was uh, telling us before about the old families and the old money that was already present, pushing in money into the research. But, it, but it's also, you know, that you know, your neighbor can do it, then you understand that I can do it. So it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's always, you know, when, when there is a, a, a really good flower shop, usually the flower shops comes on the same street. So you have a flower district in, in the cities. So it's kind of the same that, you know, uh, success feeds success and the innovation feeds innovation. So, you know, you have medical um, clusters and you have, uh, you know, like in Stockholm, it's a lot about fashion and music. Uh, and, and other like software companies, but we were really good at hardware, and we can we can be great at hardware again. I I, I would also just add that Sw Sweden has always had a great welfare state too, and I think that has helped to create a foundation where there is less fear in failing because you know you you can fall back on that, and I think also Sweden always has had a long history of being at the forefront of driving. Um, the adoption of, of new technologies and so whether it's some of the policies around driving adoption of PCs into the home or whether it was how they've approached rolling out the internet both fixed and wireless I think you know they, they've, they've done everything that they can to create foundations upon which innovation can can happen so. Could have just that's true. Could have something to do also with our uh, non-hierarchical way of doing business. Uh, we think that uh, people from the manufacturing floor or the nurse or anybody coming into the office and having a great idea for a solution, uh, it's okay to start working on the solution together. It's, it, it doesn't have to be top-down or a legacy or anything. We just li we like to work on solutions together. I, don't, I think that's a cultural thing. Uh, yeah, but it might be replicable. I, I think, yes. I think the, the... I don't want to abuse my position as co-chair of this uh, uh, conference, but obviously uh, I uh, have to say a few things uh, related to this uh, particular panel. First of all, Thank you very much, Jonas, for uh, bringing people that otherwise would have been beyond my, my radar. So it was an excellent uh, effort you made to bring these people together. I think it was a very, very, very inspiring uh, thing. And I will demonstrate that this was inspiration for me. First of all, in terms of theory, obviously you knew in advance that in, in the room, apart from a vast majority of experts, there will be a little number of dummies. I am one of them. So. I, at, at, at least I understand, so you'll confirm this uh, if I understood that correctly. Uh, 
Two in in seventeen uh, in seventeen eighty two, a mathematician from Switzerland invented. He was the uh, inventor of Sudoku. Huh? Nothing has happened. You know, two hundred had to pass uh, until uh, some uh, clever guy, an entrepreneur, as you call it, as you call it, in uh, uh, this Mr. Garns, uh, just uh, find the way to publish this Sudoku in one of the newspapers. Now, I think across uh, across the world, millions and millions of uh, people, they start uh, uh, doing uh, some Sudoku. This is helpful for, uh, for everyone. And it is uh, uh, something that probably, uh, if I understood correctly, and I, this is the first question confirmed, if I understood correctly, the difference between a pure innovation and uh, what is really uh, needed to make this innovation useful and utilized. Uh, the, the second issue, it's also uh, in terms of, uh, of a question to you. I, uh, as, as a member of the Joint Inspection Unit, I'd like to innovate a little bit uh, the ways we are uh, conceiving and doing uh, projects and review. I think you gave me the, the, the inspiration, enough inspiration and uh, uh, food for thought to, uh, to decide before having any sort of mandate from my colleagues in the Joint Inspection Unit that we will address the issue of, uh, of innovation in the United Nations system. I think that uh, uh, many of you are thinking that we should indeed take advantage of the uh, current context of the SDGs and find the best ways to, uh, to use innovation uh, as to uh, be able to really achieve these, uh, these goals. And uh, uh, we, we had also a very interesting uh, uh, panel uh, yesterday on, on blockchain, things that uh, 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 seemed at the beginning a little bit uh, esoteric for, for the United Nations bureaucratic community. Actually, we found out that there, is, uh, uh, there are enough uh, uh, brilliant minds in the systems that are uh, able to understand and are, uh, are able to take uh, uh, action on that respect. So my question to you is that uh, would you uh, help the Joint Inspection Unit in, uh, in considering the terms of reference from a perspective of uh, the private sector in, in doing such a project, understanding that we indeed feel like this is a, a, a global cause for all of us, United Nations entities, private sector, NGOs, academia, there are in the, in the room uh, a majority of uh, uh, people who are uh, teaching in university. So this would be another kind of uh, rhetorical question. Uh, uh, to, be, to be honest, I, I would expect a positive answer, but one never knows. Thank you. I think the, the question about the Sudoku, is, I think it's brilliant. Um, both, I, I would accept both to be innovation even though the first guy was probably the most. And I think it puts the topic on its edge. Because if you're the private investor like Atomico and you want to invest in Sudoku, I have no problem with it. But we need governments, taxpayers, to not invest in Sudoku. We need taxpayers to invest in guys with the ideas. So that someone later, 100 years later, can take that idea and make something out of it. That's the risk. We shouldn't do like we do today, take the money from the taxpayers, de-risk for the VCs, uh, that then only invest in, in copy and paste, because then we don't really get anything to build on. <laughs> and yes, of course, I will be happy to, to, to help with that. Now it's <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to. Uh, I'm gonna have to pick that up. We uh, we will we will welcome you with the the first seat on the uh, the first journey of the Lilium, and then uh, and then we can uh, have a beer over it. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, WFP. Yeah, it, it's a sort of a question, um, and it's one that's been bugging me for over a year now. Um, in all of the talk about sustainable uh, development, uh, green economy, uh, we heard an echo of this uh, yesterday, the, the idea that the private sector thinks that the UN system is one entity, and let's say the public sector thinks that the private sector is one entity. And 
I'm wondering why it is that everybody believes that the private sector must make a profit. Because we don't have to make a profit. We have to pay our staff, we have to pay our rent, our suppliers, and as long as we can break even over a five-year plan, sometimes we make a loss, sometimes we make a profit, but we don't need to make a profit continually. And I think that's one of the biggest er um, failures in our fin financial and economic system globally. And I'm wondering why there is an assumption in this room and outside this room that the private sector needs to make a profit. It's false. Or am I wrong? Well, I wouldn't be successful if I wasn't making money because I don't have a support from the behind. So my only way to survive is making money. But you can still do it in good ways by supporting sustainability and good things for the future. Uh, but you have much more power if you, if, if you control your own money, and that's why I choose in to be profitable. I would like to add to that as well. Uh, if you are not, not making a profit and you don't have that demand on you, uh, you sort of end up in a cycle where you're not improving yourself. So you can make a profit, but you can actually donate that profit to something. That would be acceptable, in my words. So then you have the incentive to increase the profit because that will increase the donation to whatever it is you want to do. Um, I'd like to add to that. So yes, uh, break even, that's good. I think if you have profit, you can grow and you can scale. And I think that's the best reason for any business to make a profit and enough of a growth kind of trajectory so that they can expand their reach and have more impact. I think if you're a flat business, then you this year are going to service the same number of people, solve the same number of problems as last year. It's aspirational, perhaps, to make more money so that you can reach more people or solve different problems or more problems. That's one way of thinking about it. OK, thank you. Um, that's just a a more re a reassuring in, uh, definition of the word profit. Because for me, reinvestment, whether it's into the organization to reach more people out or for in continual improvement um, or for, to increase donations to achieving the sustainable development goals, for me, that isn't, that's not making a profit. That is reinvestment. And uh, I hear, when I hear profit, I'm here adding money into the bank account to pay dividends to shareholders. That, when I hear the word profit, I, I understand that that is the expectation. So for, for you, profit is evil? <laughs> we were saying here, if you make a profit to reinvest in something uh, that helps the community, it's certainly not evil, but then it, that investment is not evil, and therefore the profit is not evil. If it's profit for self personal gain, I, then I consider it to be unethical. I think I have to say from Swedish and Scandinavian point of view, without profit, no tax, without tax, no science, without science, no innovation and growth or prosper prosperity. Without profit, no Bill Gates Foundation, right? No, you know, it, it, there's no philanthropy without profit. Well, there is some issues with that too. I mean, look at Sweden when we privatized uh, education and, and health, what happened? You can't find a doctor anywhere these days. And many of these educational companies, they just took the money to Isle of Man and then just, boom, closed it out. I think there is a confusion here in what, uh, what is meant by profit. I think uh, the gentleman there, when he talks about profit, he means, you know, greedy. And I have a problem with that. But, uh, I mean, profit is essential for having, you know, normal life. But when you go beyond that and beyond, you know, your need and your community need and become greedy and take billions out, you know, of, uh, 
it becomes a slavery. And that is, I think, when you know I have a problem with profit. All right, any other questions? Okay, Sadiq Musa, I'm from Multimedia University, Malaysia. Multimedia University, Malaysia, my name is Sadiq Musa. Actually, if you remember the collapse of Soviet Union, because there is no profit, they ignore the human nature. So the profit should be there in order to, to sustain. And this is a big point of the collapse of the Soviet Union because they ignore the human nature. Uh, but for being generous as a business, it should be mental satisfaction to contribute. You can make a profit, but you have to mentality, uh, mentality of satisfaction to contribute to humanity. This is a very key point and mutual benefit for everybody. So mental, mental satisfaction to contribute. I think that's a bit of a really cynical view of human nature. I think people are fundamentally quite social. And I think your latter point almost undermines it. The fact that people do want to contribute, that is part of our human nature. So I'm not necessarily sure there's an innate profit motive that exists with everyone. I think it's just different courses for horses. All right, I think that was the last question. Thank you so much. So please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.